tips as they come up. And you're also going to need a lot of patience and hope <laughs> for a better next season. Because sometimes things don't work out and you just have to learn from it. Um, one thing that uh, beginners often um, try and unfortunately learn the hard way that there are seasons to vegetables. And even though you can go to the grocery store and buy a tomato in the winter, you can't grow tomatoes in the winter here. So everything on the left um, column of your screen are things that we can grow here in Athens during the fall and some during the winter months. Um, the crops on the left kind of vary in their um, sensitivity to cold. So certain things like collards and cabbage can make it through all winter, usually fine. Uh, whereas spinach um, will not make it through the entire winter. Um, so we're going to talk about those crops on the left specifically um, after we go through some generals here. Um, for fall gardening, the clock is ticking. I personally feel that more than for summer gardening here in Georgia, um, timing is so crucial for the fall gardening. Um, basically, you need to plant early enough to make sure that the plants get to a decent size before the cold weather sets in and before the days start getting so short that the plants just don't grow so much even when it's a full sun day it's because the light's just not as strong. So you have to plant early enough to get them big, but you can't plant too early or they will you know, just fall apart in the heat. Um, so you have to really balance those two variables and um, I can pro provide a link in the follow-up here to general planting dates for Georgia for fall crops and for all crops. Um, it's, it's something that's variable um, year to year and, you know, lot to lot, um, but I'll do my best to give you, you know, general guidelines. Um, if you're growing your own transplants, um, you are going to want to start them now, basically, and you're going to want to start them under some kind of shade or at least protecting them from the late afternoon sun. Um, just, you know, give them a break. Um, so transplants are when you, when you sow the seeds yourself in little pots and then you grow out a little plant and then you plant that little plant into your garden. Okay, so as I said, um, site selection for a vegetable garden must have sun. And in the fall, it's really critical that your vegetable garden is placed away from trees and structures because unless the trees and the structures are on the east side of the property, um, if they're on the southwest side of the property, your whole garden or the southwest side of your garden, it's all gonna get shaded. So you want it as far away from obstacles as possible. Um, it's always going to be easier that your garden be closer to your house. Uh, you'll tend it more because you can see it um, and it's easier. So when you're putting in a vegetable garden, you do want to make sure you have your watering um, in place before you start planting. Um, because I bet as soon as you start planting, we will have a drought. <laughs> so make sure you have that in place. Um, for fall gardening and winter gardening, watering honestly is really only essential from now through I'd say maybe November. Um, in my experience here, by December we are getting enough rain that you don't need to water. You, me, I'm saying please stop raining. It's just enough, enough. So um, usually you don't have to um, water like you do in, in the summer. So that's one thing that makes it so much easier than summer gardening because it, it really takes care of itself later in the season. Um, you always want well-drained soils for your vegetable garden. Um, I'm going to talk more about soil here in a second. If you can avoid frost pockets on your property, which are usually low areas on your property, that is going to help you because the cold air will pool at the bottom. So if you can go higher, that's going to be better. Your plants will not be ex exposed to as cold of temperatures as they could. And you are going to want to protect from wild animals, pets, and children, um, meaning some type of uh, fencing or, or border or um, just some kind of exclusion. Okay, so planning your vegetable garden. You, like any garden, want to space your uh, plants and seeds according to the instructions on either the plant tag or on your seed packet. 
I highly recommend keeping a journal, um, either of the dates you start seeds, or if you're not doing it by seed, the dates when you plant things, and then follow up, you know, a few months later, um, you know, I, the, what I, you know, the, the three broccoli plants I planted on September 1st are doing great, or, you know, the three, whatever. It, it really helps you to um, see what happened in past years, what worked and what didn't work. Um, and as I wrote on this slide, planning dates are very important in fall gardening. So again, if you can document what you did, uh, it only takes a second to write it down. You'll find that it's very helpful next year <laughs> when you're like, is, is it time to start now? Uh, planning your vegetable garden. Uh, crop rotation is important for fall as it is for summer. Um, this means that you want to move your crops around your garden. Um, crops have, are, are from different families. You know, um, I'm from the Winkle family, Laura's from the Nay family. So we don't want to plant the Winkle family in consecutive years. We will do Winkle in year one and Nay in year two. So um, the equivalent with plants is we have different families of plants. And I have a slide further on that shows you the different families. Um, the, the issue with fall gardening is that um, most of the plants, plants that you're going to grow in the fall come from one family, which are brassicas. Uh, so really what you're going to be thinking of is when did I plant or where did I plant my brassicas last year, you know, um, and not planting them in the same space as you did last year or the year before. Okay, so here are the families. Um, the, the biggest ones are the fourth one down brassicas. Um, a little bit further than that, we had the cucurbitaceae. Um, those are your squash and melons and stuff like that. Um, solanaceous crops at the bottom. Uh, so there's there's like four or so families that are really, we grow a lot from each of those families and those are the ones you wanna move around. Okay, so in order to garden here in Georgia, <laughs> you gotta deal with that clay. Um, you have to deal with spreading grasses as well. And this is the hardest thing uh, coming from the north and dealing with the types of lawn grasses that are here. Uh, they just don't use these types up north. I don't know why, but the kinds here, they tend to spread on runners. And if you just go and till or cultivate a patch of lawn here, you will get more lawn. Um, so you would really be advised whenever you want to plant anything here is you kill the vegetation that's there. Um, there's a few ways you can do this. Um, you can do a procedure called occlusion where you're just smothering. Um, you're smothering the grass and weeds for about eight weeks um, during high temperatures. They just basically burn up and everything dies underneath. I, I like that method. It does kill some weed seeds, not all. Um, solarizing is another, um, is another method. It's covering the ground again, but this time with clear plastic. I think it goes a little bit quicker than the occlusion method, um, but there's a, you know, a procedure you want to follow with that. Um, I can include a link in the, um, in the email you guys will get afterwards if you want more uh, specifics on that. Another way to kill the vegetation is if you want to use an herbicide, that would be the quickest method. Um, after you've killed or removed the existing vegetation, you want to then loosen the soil by tilling um, or cultivating it. And a big note, remember this in the winter, <laughs> do not till wet soil. Um, this is a thing for me because often during the winter, I'm preparing new areas for the next year and I wanna get all this work done in the winter. And when your soil is slop, you do not wanna till it because it just creates these basically rocks of clay that then never break down into you know, a nice, nice loam. So don't till wet soil. One method that'll get you ready with a lot less time and a sore back is doing a raised bed. Um, so you basically just have a wooden frame that you're putting over vegetation. You lay cardboard down at the bottom, make sure there are no open areas, just as much cardboard as you can cover the whole space. And then you add soil, um, garden soil and compost to that and just plant right in it. Apologies if you can hear my cat, she wants to participate. 
Um, okay, a little bit more on soils. You do want to get your soil tested at your local extension office before you start gardening. Uh, the main reason for this is the pH of your soil, but also to learn basically what kind of nutrients you're working with there. A lot of times the soils are deficient uh, here in Georgia. So you're usually adding some kind of organic matter, meaning compost to the soil. Um, if you're doing organic gardening, if you're more into conventional gardening, then you would just you know, make sure that you're adding um, lime and fertilizer. So you would get your soil test at the extension office and it would let you know what your pH is and then you would incorporate lime as the test suggests. Um, pH is really important. It is the measure of hydrogen ion activity in a solution per chemist, per Rachel. It just means how alkaline or how acidic is your soil. Why does this matter? Well, it matters because nutrients are available at different levels of acidity and alkalinity. So, sorry, that was my cat. <laughs> So for some plants, if you have them in extremely acidic soil, the nutrients that you provide them, like you could just pour a whole gallon of miracle Grow on them and it's not going to work because the chemical structure of the soil won't let them take up those nutrients. Um, same if you were to use compost. Um, you have to modify your soil acidity to make it conducive to growing vegetables. Um, so as I wrote here, most soils in this area are acidic and require lime to raise pH for vegetable gardening. And if you're planning on doing this fall vegetable garden and you haven't gotten your space ready yet, um, do use the fast acting lime um, because lime takes a while to change the pH of the soil and you don't have months right now uh, to change the pH of your soil. Here's an example, a picture that shows you the effects of the wrong pH on a plant. So the ones on the, ele on the left, I think these are kale plants. Um, on the left, you have them growing in very acidic soil. The ones on the right are in rather balanced soil. So the ones on the right look normal, the ones on the left, they just can't absorb the nitrogen to grow. Okay, so you must have for in your garden to grow something. Um, up in the north, up in Alaska, you could potentially get away with tilling a new plot and having everything you need right there. But here in Georgia, our topsoil is gone generally um, from intensive agriculture, cotton production, and you know, and all that that um, was going on here for a long time. So we do have to help the soil to get good plants. I prefer to use compost um, just because I do grow all my vegetables organically, um, but you can use you know, conventional fertilizer like miracle Grow. Um, just know that you will um, need some kind of fertilizer. Um, a note at the bottom, those slow release granules that come in a, like a shaky container, those don't work in the winter because it's not warm enough for them to work. Um, they need it to be like, I don't know if it's 70 degrees, there's a certain temperature they need it to be in order to actually release their um, chemicals. So if you need to um, fertilize something in December, you're going to need to use some kind of liquid um, fertilizer, not granules. Uh, just a note, um, because containers are so popular and there are so many cool um, combinations and you know you can do a vegetable container that looks purely ornamental, um, just realize that this is not, um, it's going to be more, uh, what is it called? It's going to be affected more by extremes in temperature. So our first frost date is generally around October 15th. Um, these plants are going to feel the full weight of that frost much more than plants in the ground because their whole soil structure is above ground. They are you know, um, much more sensitive to the air temperature. The air temperature is gonna affect the soil much more. Uh, so you lose two hardiness zones when you grow in a container. So you have to keep that in mind if you're doing a fall, fall or winter container gardening, covering plants um, when there is, you know, a, a frost chance or when it's going to get, you know, really cold would definitely be a good idea. Or if you can bring them into your garage, even better. 
Um, when you start with transplants, you always want to start with healthy transplants. And I apologize that I don't have a fall <laughs> plants here. These are tomatoes. Um, but, you know, same rule applies. One thing to mention, I've noticed that in um, a lot of the big box stores, when you buy transplants, they do tend to be leggy. Um, as long as they're not too leggy, it seems that brassicas are fine with that. Um, you know, leggy, like the picture on the left, see how the plants are very um, stout and just thick. And leggy would be, you know, if they're just a long spindle. I mean, you don't want six inches of spindle <laughs> before the actual leaves, but you can have a little bit. And the brassica crops like cabbage, collards, broccoli, they'll be okay. They'll just kind of have a little stem there. Uh, when you plant, um, you want to use mulch. Um, you're going to do it immediately. Don't wait. Um, you don't have to mulch, um, but it is a good idea to have some on hand, particularly if we get really cold. Um, my first year here, it got to 14 degrees in November, and it was apparently, like, I, I, I didn't know what was normal then. I now know that was very much not normal. Um, <laughs> if it gets down that cold, you had better throw some pine straw or something over your plants uh, to keep them warm. But in this sense, we're just talking about mulching to keep the soil a more consistent temperature. Um, and it, you know, it, it just um, is better for the plant. It keeps diseases away from the plant as well. Uh, watering the garden, just a reminder that this is going to be important in the beginning. So make sure you know how you're going to water when you get the thing started here this month and next month. Um, hose with a nozzle, drip uh, irrigation is great. Um, sprinklers are not great. Uh, sprinklers are a really bad idea because wet foliage leads to disease. Um, and then a note there that's important during the winter, do not work in the garden when it's wet from rain or dew um, because it usually seems so wet here in the winter. Uh, disease with the uh, droplets, so you do not want to go picking or doing anything when the garden's wet. Um, weed control is much, much less of an issue in the fall and winter, oh my goodness. Um, yeah, it's, it's, it's just, it's almost night and day. So there will be weeds um, and you will need to pull them, but it won't be as bad as summer when you look at a crabgrass one week and it's an inch across and then the next week it's like a foot across and in full flower. Um, you have a little bit more leeway. Um, so when we grow crops, generally they need to be pollinated um, to, well, they do need to be pollinated in order to reproduce and pollination is the transfer of pollen from the male part of the flower to the female part of the flower, whether that is on the same plant or on different plants. Um, however, in the fall and winter, you don't need pollination to produce your vegetables. Um, an example, broccoli. What you're eating with broccoli is simply the unopened flowers. So you don't need a pollinator because if you let your broccoli actually flower, um, you probably aren't gonna wanna eat it. Um, although I know people do eat broccoli flowers and you could garnish your dish, but you know, you're not going to get ahead of broccoli. So um, you don't need to worry as much about pollinators in the fall and winter. You, you don't need to worry at all. Um, this is um, related to an earlier slide about just protecting your garden. Deer are very abundant in the fall. They're very hungry because the trees are losing leaves. Um, they just don't have as much food. So, you know, keep in mind that you would it would be a good idea to erect a barrier around your garden to keep away deer particularly if you live in a really woody neighborhood okay so timing the garden um the hardest problem in georgia in, in doing the fall gardening is this time right now when it is 93 degrees outside and you need to sow your carrots or start your lettuce and it's 93 degrees outside and they would really prefer that it be 73 but it's not um so there's you know more work in the beginning um but it's a lot easier as we go along uh so as i said before you know learn from your experience and please um i i love the internet um it's a great resource 
However, you have to be careful about where you get your information uh, for growing vegetables because what is true in New York is not necessarily true here in Georgia. And particularly um, charts that say, you know, this month is when you do this and this month's when you do that. I mean, I've seen those circulating online and they could be completely irrelevant for Georgia. Um, so you need local advice. And the best local advice is from the university. I mean, they've studied it, they know. Um, so if you have a question, when you Google it, if you can Google, you know, if your question's about um, carrot germination, Google carrot germination and EDU or and UGA, and you will, your results will come up and they will be more, um, I say reliable than spruce.com or, or whatever websites are out there. Okay, here's that chart again. It's all in the timing just to remind you what um, you can grow and what you can't. Um, a lot of brassicas, a lot of leafy crops. Uh, we're gonna talk a little bit about onions. Um, I'm not sure if I have a slide on potatoes. So let me explain. Potatoes are in that left column because they are planted uh, before St. Patty's Day. So you usually go out and buy your potatoes like in late February. You can go to a garden center. Um, you can order them online and you plant potatoes there in late February, March, um, and then you harvest them in about May. So I consider that a winter crop because it's still usually pretty chilly. We have chilly days in March. Okay, so let's get on to some specific crops here. Whoopsies. Okay, cabbage. Um, cabbage is so loved by many. I am not a particular fan, but <laughs> I grow it anyways. Uh, cabbage are heavy feeders. Um, when I say that, I mean they like a lot of nutrients. So if you grow cabbage, you know, in a, in a composted bed one year, um, the next year you might not have quite enough fertility in that bed because the cabbage took it all up. So you're going to want to add more compost to that bed to make it, you know, appropriate for the next crop. Or you would want to grow something that doesn't require as many nutrients after you grew the cabbage. So keep that in mind. Um, Cabbage, again, we have the timing thing. Uh, you want to plant it early enough for it to start developing a head before it gets too cold. And I had direct experience with this last year, unfortunately. Um, I tried to do succession planting of fall vegetables um, because I figured it would be the same as summer. You know, succession planting is when you um, let's say I plant a um, 10 cabbage um, this week and then I plant 10 cabbage two weeks from now and then I plant 10 cabbage a month from now. So I was trying to do that but I was planting the cabbage in December I believe and they never produced a head. Um, basically come spring they shot out a flower and if there was a head it was like two inches across. It was ridiculous. So make sure you get your cabbage in. Um, I would say in September, um, either this month or in early September. Um, just a note that younger heads are gonna store better than older heads and cabbage generally does store well in the refrigerator. Um, if you plant late, meaning like late September, October, you'll harvest in late winter. Um, okay, so the biggest uh, enemy to cabbage growing and a lot of brassica growing is this butterfly right here. This is called the cabbage white butterfly. And if you were to see me in my on my farm when I see these guys trying to chase after them and catch them, <laughs> but they're very bad. Um, it is called the imported cabbage worm, and it has uh, it's a white butterfly with black spots. The females have two spots per wing, and the males have one spot. And those females will go and lay their eggs on your cabbage, on your broccoli, on your cauliflower. Um, those eggs will turn into tiny little um, worms that then eat the plant. Um, so you have to be aware of this, um, particularly if you want to grow things like broccoli, um, cabbage, uh, cauliflower. Uh, there's a, a couple control methods. Um, 
from my experience, you can either use some kind of chemical to stop the um, eggs from turning into the worm, or, or I'm sorry, the eggs will hatch, but the worm won't end up living. Spinosad and Bt are two organic products. Um, Bt is only harmful to uh, caterpillars. Spinosad is harmful to a larger range of insects. Um, although it is organic, you only want to use spinosad in the uh, late evening hours so that you avoid any contact with uh, pollinators. Um, personally, I don't really like the, the, that method um, just because it requires me to remember to do it. So uh, I like to uh, use the exclusion method. Um, where I basically just don't let the butterflies have an opportunity to lay their eggs on my plants. And I do this by putting bird netting over um, brassica plants, but especially the real vulnerable ones. Um, and here, this last point, um, just to, 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 to make you even more hopeful and optimistic about this fall winter, <laughs> that, uh, there's a lot of them in Georgia. So um, if you grow brassicas, you are probably going to see this butterfly. Um, okay, so I guess I have already discussed all these points. Um, the third one, though, is something to, to um, note. If you don't net and you don't do any spraying and you don't do any monitoring and you grow um, the heading vegetables like the broccoli, cauliflower, cabbage, it is possible that you could grow what looks like a totally fine head of broccoli or cauliflower, but when you take it into the kitchen to cut it up, you have a surprise. Um, so do note that even though you don't see the butterfly, the eggs might be in there. So please <laughs> keep it in mind. Okay, so this picture on the right is, is how I exclude them from my broccoli. This is broccoli and I just take uh, concrete reinforcing wire. You can use anything that'll bend in a hoop, anything to keep that netting a little bit above the plants. Um, and I just, um, lay the netting over the structure and even if the butterfly hovers around there they can't get to the plant to actually lay their eggs so it's it's just a wonderful solution um, depending on how much fertility you have in your soil your plants might um, kind of outgrow the, the wire they might get really tall but at that point we could be well, we're, we will be further along in the winter and there is a point when these butterflies go away i mean you generally don't see them in january in late december um, unless we have like super warm weather but in my experience i don't le need to leave the netting on all winter long um, i can take it off um, by the time it's cold outside okay so moving on to carrots, I saw that some people were very excited about growing carrots and I love carrots. I love to make carrot juice from carrots. Um, they, are, they are difficult to get growing, but once they're going, um, well, I, let's just say, I guess people have had difficulties with them. There's some things to keep in mind. <laughs> so um, first of all, you know, a carrot is a long root crop. So, you know, the picture on the top right, um, you can see that whole thing has to be able to penetrate through the soil. Um, so nice, fluffy, well-drained soil is great for carrots. Hard, compacted clay is not great for carrots. Um, if your soil is not tilled up very well, um, if you don't till it all, you're not going to succeed with carrots because they just, they're not going to poke through this, this red clay. Um, I've, I've grown um, carrots in hard soil before and they will literally like uproot themselves from the ground. They're like, well, we can't go down, so we'll just go up. And once the carrot starts growing up out of the ground, it gets the green collar on it because it's exposed to the sun. So very well drained soil, very, um, very light, very loose um, to a depth of about a foot. Now, if you just cannot make that possible, there are small um, carrots, I'm, I'm uh, blanking on the name, but there's like mini carrots um, that you could grow that only get to be a few inches long. So that might be an option for you. So germinating the carrots is difficult. Um, it does require um, 
careful attention. It requires you to not go on vacation during the time you're germinating your carrots unless you have a really good friend or neighbor who can come over and water the pot um, while you're gone. In my experience, for a day like today, a hot day today, it is morning watering and evening watering. Um, the seed has to stay moist and carrots take a while to germinate. So that's, that's, that's the difficulty with carrots. They take a while. I mean, it could be, I mean, it could be as quick as a week, but it could take as long as two weeks for them to come up. So you have to just keep watering and watering and watering while that happens or while you're waiting for them to come up. Also, you have to watch out for um, wildlife that like carrots, <laughs> like bunnies and, and other little critters, because um, it, it really isn't fun if you finally get your carrots to germinate and then you walk out there the next day and half of them are gone because somebody ate them. It seems like the bunnies and, and whatever little pests and rodents are on my farm, they really love the little carrot seedlings. So you could do that. Um, the same as the slide before that netting um, or any just any protection to try to exclude them but with the little critters you have to be better about um, making sure the netting is secure on the bottom for the cabbage butterfly when you're using the netting for that it's okay if there's you know a little bit of opening at the very bottom an inch or two because generally the butterfly is not going to fly that low and get in but with those little animals forget it um, so so do do prepare for that. Um, and then the last point um, about carrots, fall winter carrots are so much better than spring carrots in my opinion because the, the frost makes them sweeter. So um, even if you're able to grow a full-size full carrot before the first frost date, you would want to wait until it frosts before you pull it up because chances are it's going to have much more sugar, it's going to be sweeter after it's been cold outside. Um, the only thing about this, when I learned about this, um, my head took it as, oh, well then I can store them in the winter, all, or I can store them in the ground all winter long, because um, they'll just get sweeter and sweeter. Um, I don't know if, if there's a sweetness limit to them, um, but do know that the longer you keep them in the ground at you know, peak um, harvest time, the more other animals are gonna know they're there. Um, maggots or insects on in the ground can potentially eat holes in them. Um, if we have crazy water or crazy rain, um, you might have splitting carrots. So yes, you can hold them in the ground, but don't hold them in the ground too long before you harvest them. Okay, on to collards. Um, I think collards are actually pretty easy here. Um, you do want to grow them by transplant if you're a beginner, for sure. Um, don't you know? Don't bother trying to grow your own seeds out. Um, so you just pick up some transplants, and they are just average um, fertility needs. Again, the frost improves the flavor, like the carrots. Um, I have the beware the cabbage butterfly, but it's really not as, it, it, to me, it doesn't seem to be as big of a problem on collards as it is on some of the other plants. But maybe that's because when I see, you could see the damage on the collards. And you know, okay, I'm not going to eat that leaf. Whereas the ones I described before, sometimes you don't know until you're ready to put it um, in the, you know, cut it up for <laughs> your dish. So, um, but I don't cover my collards and I don't spray them either. And they seem to be fine. Um, so if you really like collards, maybe plant a few extra just in case. Okay, kale. Um, just like collards and just like carrots, kale wants frost for flavor. Uh, fall and winter kale tastes delicious. Um, kale in June does not taste delicious to me. Um, very bitter. Um, it, it, it really is very bitter when you grow it out of season, but the cool weather, even, even cold, it, it likes that and it tastes better for it. Um, I recommend transplants. I wrote here August 30th, latest recommended planting date. That was probably um, a UGA recommendation. I personally have gone later. Um, but then again, with climate change, you know, it seems like um, here we tend to have a frost um, that will kill all of your summer vegetables that have still managed to stay alive. Um, and then it'll be 75 degrees again for a month, you know, or whatever. So, um, 
I think you could go later than August 30th. I think mid-September, actually September should be fine. Um, but Laura, correct me on that at the end if I'm wrong. Um, one problem with kale that I've noticed is harlequin bugs and again, the cabbage worms from the cabbage butterfly. Um, harlequin bugs, um, they're kind of the shape of a stink bug, but they're black and red in color. Um, and they reproduce like mad. So if you see them on the plant, pick them off um, or get them, get them gone. Because they will eat that thing gone. Oh, there we go. There's the harlequin bug. Okay, lettuce. So lettuce is a great fall crop here in Athens. It's not a great winter crop, but it's a great fall crop. Um, so if you're in the lettuce, um, get it growing. Uh, you could plant it. I'd say you technically you or you could probably plant it now, but you would want some shade. Um, maybe planting it next to something tall, um, or if you do it in a container, making sure it gets afternoon shade. I don't mean keeping it in shade all day long, but it is not going to be happy with 93 degrees right now. Um, so I guess. If you're doing transplants, you could wait a little bit on this. Um, one thing to note, if you're into this head lettuce here on the right, the reason why you don't generally see that for sale in stores around here, the, the transplants, the little plants, um, is because it doesn't grow well here at all. Um, head lettuce just doesn't like Georgia. Leafy lettuce is good. Um, your romaines, um, this here is uh, called Starfighter on the left. It is my favorite green lettuce variety from Johnny Seeds. Uh, very sweet leaves. So leaf lettuce is better. Um, and there's no difference in growing difficulty between the different colors of lettuce. You know, red isn't any harder than green. So, you know, give it a whirl. Um, if you do it from seed, it, um, I would suggest doing it in cell packs and not direct seeding it um, just because of all the issues like with the carrots getting them to come up. Um, I find it's easier when I'm starting seeds to have them in the little cell packs or in little containers in one area so that I can remember to water that area and get them going and baby them. Um, it is going to require attentive watering for best results. Um, you know, lettuce is mostly water, so if we have a drought and you don't water it, it is not going to be happy. Um, it will not survive a hard freeze, and that's why I said you can enjoy it in fall, but not in winter. Um, and if we have a particularly rainy fall, do not feel bad if your lettuce dies. Uh, my lettuce dies every every fall, late fall. Um, you, you can't help the weather and we have very rainy winters here. So enjoy your lettuce in the fall. Um, spinach can go a little bit longer than lettuce. Um, it seems to be a little bit more tolerant of the cold. Um, so you could potentially grow that, you know, longer into the winter. There's a couple different types of spinach. There's smoothly your Savoy, it's really just your personal preference on what kind of leaf you want. Um, the picture here, it looks like it's a Savoy. Um, see, the, there's like a wrinkle on the leaf. And um, spinach can be grown from a transplant. Uh, usually people think about just sowing spinach seeds. Um, and a note on um, sowing spinach seeds, if you have um, a big box full of old seed packets and spinach is in there, um, I'm sorry to tell you, but the packet's basically worthless. Um, spinach seed really it does not last long at all. Um, I buy it new every year because I find that the germination just it falls off very quickly with it. Um, if you do transplanting spinach, so if you buy it at a store, be sure it's a small plant. Um, spinach has a tap root, and while you can transplant it, you do have to do it when it's very, very young. Um, and keep in mind that that transplant is going to hold you back in time. Um, it, it's going to take it a week at least to get used to the new conditions. And just a personal anecdote, and, and this was in my um, high tunnel, which is like an unheated greenhouse, so it's, it's, it's not necessarily exactly what would happen outside, but just to, to illustrate, um, last year I grew spinach transplants, I, I don't know what date, let's just say I started transplants on November 1st, planted them in my high tunnel, you know, let's say two weeks later, 
And then I sowed spinach seeds after I planted those transplants. And I will tell you later down the line, the ones that I sowed by seed did better and got larger than the ones I tried to transplant. The ones I transplanted just kind of were much slower and not as strong of a plant. So it's, it's possible, um, but you have to go quick with it and get them in the ground quick. Uh, do not overwater spinach. It does not like that much water. Oh, onions. I love onions. Um, onions are so easy, in my opinion, because you plant them when you have nothing else really to do outside. Um, you, you plant them in January, and then you harvest them in early summer. Um, so if you've ever grown onions and they just got to be these little, you know, quarter size things, um, if you can remember when did you plant those onions? Um, because a lot of times people will buy a pack of onions at a store in March and they don't get big because <clears throat> with onions, every week that you delay planting them past the what the past the like recommended date for your area every week you go past that you lose a layer in the onion um like a, a leaf is a layer of the onion and so it's just it it has a predetermined time for when it's going to bulb up and you need to get it in the ground early enough that it has enough vegetative growth before that bulbing starts um, I get, as I said, I, I get my transplants in January. This January was a little crazy. Uh, I just remember there being a lot of 20s, like high 20s or mid 20s when I got my onions and I had to hold off planting them until we got back into the 30s. Um, so onions just, they grow great in, in Georgia. Our acidity level is usually pretty, um, or the soil acidity level is pretty good here for them. Um, I do recommend using a fungicide if you uh, want perfect onions um, because there are fungal diseases that affect them like they do your tomatoes in the summer. Um, so if you, you know, if you want to go hardcore, a fungicide definitely would be recommended. Um, I would also recommend this variety, Texas Legend, has done very well for me. Um, Texas Early White is another variety that's done well for me. Um, a note on that too. So you're in this class, you've tried um, growing such and such, it didn't work out. Um, it's not necessarily you the reason why it didn't work out. There's like a million reasons why it didn't work out. And one of them could simply be the variety that you chose. Um, with onions, there are certain varieties that just won't do well here no matter what you do and i don't want to get too far into onions we do have like short day varieties intermediate varieties long day varieties but what i'm just trying to say is that um even though a carrot's a carrot there are like hundreds of types of varieties of carrots you know and some do better than others and some do better in georgia than others so having friends in the gardening or talking to extension uj extension you know hey what are some good carrot varieties or what are some good onion varieties like that are well suited to athens tell me um you know it's it's a good idea to find out what those are and use those ones um, and you harvest an onion when in early summer when the top falls over Rachel, okay. can I uh, ask yes. you a couple onion questions yes. while we're on the topic? Yes. So we had a question about if you are not using transplants, but you're actually starting from seed, uh, when would you want to sow those seeds? Wow, that's a good question. So, well, since I'm growing the transplant in January, I would say you would want to sow them. If you're doing under grow lights, I'd say late September. Um, I'm not... Like I've never grown onions from seeds, so I'm not sure about the time from um, sowing to when you can actually put out. Um, so what I would do if, to this person who asked this question, look up onion onion varieties and onion seeds and see what the days, um, how many days it takes um, to produce the onion and then count back from, I guess what it would be late May or early June. Um, yeah, Laura, do you are you aware that onions take a super long time to get to get mm -hmm. ready to be like transplantable? Yeah, I'm in the same boat as you. All okay. the production that I've done of head, like when you're looking for the head onion, not like green onions, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I've done with transplants. So um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Question: We can definitely uh, 
look up some more in-depth information, but I would have gone with the same method that you you said, Rachel. I'd be shopping right now for my seeds, definitely. If I was if I was planning on doing that, I'd be shopping for my seeds, yeah. And then on a related note, uh, where are some good resources for getting transplants? Um, well, so I can't specifically give um, company recommendations. Um, so I'm not really sure how to answer this question. Like with the, with, if I do a talk with the private group, I could tell you right where I order my onions from, but, um, Laura. <laughs> yeah, no, well, it's hard because those extensions, so we can't promote any particular company over another. Um, but if what we can do is in the follow-up notes, uh, which Joanna will be sitting out uh, within a day or so of this, we can include some good resources for finding reputable sources. The main thing is that you, I mean, the best thing to do is talk to a friend that's done it and yeah. has liked who they're getting them from. Um, but as long as you're getting it from a reputable source that, you know, tests their material for disease and, and at weed seeds and things like that. So. Right, right. All right, that's it on onions. Oh, Thank okay. you. Um, oh, it just, just to note with onions, you are very likely going to have to buy them online. Um, we're going to be sending you, I'm, I'm assuming, online sources because it doesn't seem like they ever sell them at the right time here. <laughs> I don't see them in stores when they should be there. Okay, garlic. If you're into garlic, now is the time to think about it. and Think about how much you want to grow um, for harvest next summer. Um, garlic takes a long time to grow. Um, you're going to look at soft-necked varieties. Um, the reason why we want soft neck varieties of garlic as opposed to hard neck varieties of garlic is because these soft necks do not bolt easily, meaning they don't flower. They don't just suddenly think, okay, it's time to flower and send up a stock. Um, they tend to be okay with our erratic temperature fluctuations um, here in the winter where it is, you know, 70 degrees one day and 45 degrees the next day. They can handle that. Um, with garlic and onions, you do not want the plant to flower. Um, when it flowers, while great for pollinators and bees, it's not a good vegetable <laughs> anymore. I mean, not to say that you can't eat it, um, but when the flowerscape comes up, it's like this, it's, it's, it, it, it's, you, you do this happening. Um, but sometimes it's, it's, really difficult. I'm sorry, I'm kind of going back to onions here. Um, but when onions are subjected to a lot of uh, temperature fluctuations in the winter, you tend to get more plants putting up a flowerscape um, in the spring. And you could think, well, what did I do? What did I do last week? And now they're, you know, suddenly flowering. Uh, likely it wasn't you, it was just the weather. Um, they got confused and thought that they'd gone through a whole second season and it was time to flower. So we want to use soft neck varieties because we don't want our garlic to bolt or go to flower, um, and they are less likely to do that. Um, you want to order your cloves now, and this is something we can, you know, give a, a few um, suggestions for reputable vendors. Um, you do not want to use grocery store cloves um, because they likely have been treated, so they won't um, germinate or they won't come up or um, more importantly, they might not be the right variety for our area. Um, and that is crucial. So uh, you plant the garlic. What you do when you, when you buy garlic to plant, they're going to send you literally like full garlic bulbs, you know, the whole shebang. Uh, well, actually, some places will send you like a full one and then give you like half of the cl cloves taken out of the other because these things are kind of expensive. So they are like really good about saying, okay, that's 16 ounces. But anyways, you get your big, you know, garlic and then you, when you're, the day that you plant is when you break it up into the individual cloves and then you literally stick a clove three to four inches deep um, into the ground. Um, you need to make sure that the root side is facing down. Uh, you should be able to see that because you broke up the clove, you know. Um, so you plant about three to four inches deep in November. It takes a while to germinate. I mean, it could be a few weeks to, uh, I've seen um, over a month, I want to say a month and a half one year it took my clothes to come up. So it can take a while. Um, and by 
in the fall, I don't believe I had to water my garlic. I mean, if we had a year like, um, what was it, 2000? The year we moved here was a super, super, super dry fall. Um, like if we're in the middle of a drought, yeah, you would want to uh, water that garlic a little bit to make sure it doesn't dry out. Um, but generally, it's going to be fine January, February, by March or April. Um, if we start getting warm, you're going to need to put um, some irrigation on it or water it yourself, you know, with your hose um, in the spring. And it's ready to, I'm not, let me see if I, oh, no, okay, sorry, I thought I had a slide. It's ready to harvest when about half of the leaves have turned brown. Okay, radish. Um, radish is a great one to try if you're a beginner. Um, it's very easy, it's very quick. Uh, you sow it, comes up, um, in 28 days you are ready to eat the radish. Um, optimal temperatures are about 50 to 65 degrees, um, so I would not sow a radish right now. Um, unless I was really into radishes, then I would be willing to experiment. Um, but they, they might, um, if, if you do it when it's too hot, the, the texture and stuff, it just doesn't work out. They, and anyway, so um, radishes, September, I'd start sowing them and you can succession sow radishes if you really like radishes, meaning you sow, you know, what, however many you want um, one week and then, you know, a week or two later, you sow a little bit more and on and on. Um, you want to keep the moisture consistent, um, especially when um, you're waiting for it to germinate. Um, and then the temperature, like how cold could it get before you lose it? Um, what I found was that 26 degrees can damage the leaves, but you can still harvest the actual radish root and eat that. I would not hold the radish in the ground personally. I mean, I think there's a lot of insects that would eat it. Um, I would. Um, you know, like, like I said, you could hold the, car the carrots in the ground, the radish, in my experience, is eaten up more quickly. So harvest when it is ready and then store in your fridge. Um, if you've never seen a daikon radish, uh, this is what they look like. Um, they are a spicy radish. Um, I've seen people use them in slaws. I, I grow them and I'm sorry, I, I could talk to you all day long about growing vegetables, but then when it comes to like preparing them and making dishes, I'm like, what do you do with this? I'm not less good, but daikon radishes are kind of a specialty crop. Um, and they're really actually pretty easy here. Um, they're easier than a carrot, even though they look like a carrot. So if you're in a spicy, you might want to try daikon radish. And you do it, um, you direct seed it. You do not transplant daikon radishes. Um, you know, the third bullet point can also be used to break out compacted soil. I mean, yes, yes, maybe. Um, but as you see in this picture, what happened here on the right, instead of growing down, um, the daikon grew up. Um, it really, I mean, it, it does tend to heave out of the soil um, when it's ready to be um, harvested, but not that much. <laughs> so well-drained, um, raised bed type planting. Okay, um, I guess here's a suggestions about storing uh, radishes. Um, spraying, if you were to grow the radishes in the spring, you gotta be really quick about getting them out of the ground or they get yucky. Um, in the fall or the winter, you can store them in the ground if the temperatures are mild. Um, but if it's going to be cold for a long period of time, you would want to cover them uh, with straw or mulch or blankets or whatever during the evenings uh, to protect them. Broccoli. Broccoli is one of my favorite uh, vegetables. I love growing broccoli. Um, didn't have great success when I first started here because of that cabbage worm, but I've kind of cracked the code and I love broccoli. Um, so broccoli, you want to buy transplants of broccoli unless you're you know, good at sowing seeds, um, in which case make your own transplants. I can um, really recommend a variety called Imperial. Um, I started that last year and I am in love with this variety because it can handle heat very well. Um, so it's really a good one to be planting, you know, in September, it can handle the 90 degrees. Um, 
kind of going out of out of um, order in terms of the points here. Um, but the the thing about broccoli that people, um, you know, I don't want to say fail, but it, it doesn't work out, um, is they they end up with like a quarter size broccoli head. You know, um, why did that happen? Well, it happened because the plant did not make enough leaves to be able to get itself to make the flower. Um, so what this means is that you needed more fertility in your soil. Your soil was poor, um, it didn't have good nitrogen, it didn't have good nutrients to make big green leaves. Because the bigger the plant, um, the bigger the head you're gonna get. So fertility, fertility, fertility for broccoli. They, they need good compost or good supplemental fertilization. If you are growing your own transplants and you can choose your varieties, um, if you don't take my advice and do Imperial, make sure you choose a variety that has a dome-shaped head. Uh, sometimes catalogs will label that, sometimes they won't, but you can usually see in the picture, like they're, they're generally either dome-shaped or they're flat. And the flat heads don't work well here because of our lovely rain in the fall and winter, particularly winter, um, it, it just collects on that flat broccoli head and rots it. So if you get a, a variety with a dome-shaped head, the water will um, trickle down it more easily and you don't have um, rot issues. Uh, plant in September, October, harvest in December, January. Okay, so harvesting on time you want to check your broccoli. Once it's started growing the head, the head will grow depending on the temperature. So if we're having very cool weather, the head's gonna grow very slowly. Um, the warmer the weather, the faster the head will grow. Um, you have to watch the head. And you know, if you're a beginner at growing broccoli, it's kind of like, eh, I'm not sure, is it ready yet? Um, I look at the size of the head, and how the little individual flowers look in the head. And if you look at the picture on the top right, all those little of your screen, all those little dots there are individual flowers. Like the, the broccoli um, is really just a thousands of flowers all together, thousands of unopened flowers. So you want those little flowers to be tight. In this picture, it's a really tight head because what happens if you don't harvest that on time, this. Um, see at the on the picture on the right, the top, um, those are the flowers. They've kind of elongated and then they're going to open up into these um, pretty yellow flowers. So you have to make sure that you get to it in time. A few years ago, I planted broccoli. My husband was in um, an accident and I didn't have time to monitor my patch and it was in January. Well, I had enough time to monitor it. I guess I didn't have time to monitor it enough or act on my thoughts because I looked out there and I said, oh, okay, that broccoli looks good. We're going to have some good broccoli. I need to make sure I pick that in the next week or two. By the time I actually got out there to pick it, we had had really warm weather, just out of season warm weather and shoo, it's all flowers. Um, and a note on this, if you do grow imperial broccoli, that heat tolerant variety, you can grow it in the spring. It will grow in the spring for, for harvest and early summer, but you have to be so quick to harvest it in early summer because as I said, how quick that head grows is dependent on the temperature. Um, I learned this spring that you've got like one or two days to pick that head in the spring, early summer. In the fall, winter, you've got about a week or so depending on whether to pick the head. Um, on a positive note, if you miss and you don't pick it, the pollinators will absolutely love the flowers. The local bees, they will be so happy that you let a broccoli flower. Okay, cauliflower um, is more difficult just because of our wet, rainy weather. Um, the cauliflower just don't like um, seven days in a row of rain. Um, so that is one uh, difficulty with growing it here. Um, it also needs fertility. It needs fertilization like the broccoli. So the size of your head is going to be um, a function of how, how fertile the soil is. 
um, and how old the plant is and the temperature. So one thing with cauliflower um, that I learned is it it is you cannot control when that head starts forming, uh, meaning you can't. It's succession planting cauliflower will not work because the head the formation of the head is triggered by temperature. Um, and so it goes through like a chill period. And then once it's decided that it's warm, it makes that head. And there's, I'm, I'm sorry, I can't think of the, of, the, of the word for this, but it's, it's just dependent on a factor you can't control. So what this means for you is that you need to make sure you get your cauliflower in the ground early enough that the plant gets big enough so when that temperature change happens, it's ready to have that head out. Um, most of the uh, newer seed varieties, if you do these from seed, the, the leaves tend to wrap the head. Um, in the picture on the top right, the leaves are not wrapping the head at all, um, but for these like self-wrapping varieties, the leaves will kind of, um, they'll, be, they'll be turned the other way, like they're convex, they'll turn concave and kind of shade that head because you don't want um, cauliflower heads to be exposed to full sun. Um, they will separate and like, bolt quicker or they just and they'll turn a weird color and all that so if you buy cauliflower transplants from the store you plant your broccoli and you start seeing a head forming but the leaves are all splayed out what you can do is just get a rubber band and tie the leaves at the tip um, so that that uh, head is covered and protected from the, the sun okay so that's the point here on the the first point here about uh, tying up the leaves um, so tiny, there's actually a name for tiny heads on broccoli. It's called buttoning. Um, and as I said, it's caused by low fertility, um, old transplants, cold temperatures of planting or disease or insects. In my, in my experience, it is really the fertility that's going to get you um, with the cauliflower. Um, sometimes you will grow it and you'll get heads that are okay, except they look a little fuzzy. Um, and that's from uh, real big temperature swings um, that you can't control. Um, the picture on the top right there, that's what happens when you don't pick the cauliflower on time. Um, it started developing that purplish color from the sun and it's also starting to um, undo itself. See how it's kind of like bloating. Um, you can still eat it when it's bloating, but it's uh, harder to cut up and it's just, um, it's, it's not the same. You know, it's edible, but it's, you know. So you have to pick it on time as well. Okay, uh, turnips, another crop. Um, you can grow turnips for the leaves or for the roots. Um, I think there's different varieties of seed for that purpose. So if you're more into eating the turnip root, you would grow that type. Um, if you're more into the leaves, you know, you would, you would grow that type. Um, and you can either uh, grow it from seed or transplant. I, I seed my turnips. Um, and you harvest when the roots about two to three inches in diameter any bigger and it's gonna taste um, awful very fibery extremely hard to cut <laughs> so um, make sure you you watch and pick it when um, it's ready and turnips i believe will store um in the fridge for a while so you know if you if you have to harvest it um you should have some time um, in storage for it Okay, so Swiss chard is interesting um, to me because it, I grow it for sale in the early summer, on the spring, early summer. Um, so it can handle the hot weather, but it really can't handle very cold weather. Um, so you have to get this one going like now if you're growing from seed um, transplant I would get that in early September um, and uh, just make sure that you protect it um, if we have some very cold days you know um, this fall you, you will need to protect it from temperatures like under I mean at least under 30 um, it just, it's, it's just not as hardy as a lot of the other crops we're talking about. Um, so know that. Um, little background on Swiss chard, it is actually a beet. 
um, that's been selected for its leaves um, at the expense of its roots. And uh, let's see, if you are not harvesting it regularly, you would want to remove the old leaves as they might have disease problems on them or whatnot and you know keep the plant clean. Uh, beets, heavy feeder. Um, you're going to direct sow beets. You can't transplant uh, beets. You can't generally transplant root crops. Um, that's like, you know, when you want to transplant um, things, it's better if they have a fibrous root system than a tap root. So it's kind of sort of like that, except the root is a ball. Um, so you direct seed the beets. Um, and unless you get... Uh, I don't know if I'm using the right word here, decorticated possibly, if that's the wrong word, I'm sorry, but uh, beet seeds, um, basically when you sow a beet seed, you end up getting like five beets coming out from the seed, like you get multiple seedlings coming up, um, but you can only have one of those, so you have to go and thin each separate one, which is different than thinning in general. And I should mention this, <clears throat> hearkening back to the carrots. When you sow seeds, um, you're gonna wanna sow more seeds than you actually plan to have um, because you don't know if all of them are going to come up. Um, if you buy from some vendors like Johnny's, your packet will actually say the percentage germination on it and maybe carrots will say 84%, so 84 out of 100 seeds in Johnny's trial germinated, 16% um, did not germinate. So <clears throat> you usually overseed um, and then you go back once things have germinated and you just cut out you know, the extras and you cut it so that there is enough space in between each plant, you know, so that each one can grow to an appropriate size. Um, so with beets, it's a little different because you, you, you will potentially thin between plants, but you're also like thinning the actual plant you sowed, which, which is interesting and weird. Um, so, and then you harvest the root at a desirable size, which is about one and a half to three inches in diameter. Um, kohlrabi, I think this is one of the last vegetables I have here in the talk. Um, I, you know, kohlrabi is really easy to grow here. Um, this is a great beginner one. Um, it's easy from seed and it's, it's just really easy to grow. And it has, um, you can eat it raw or you can eat it, um, you know, cooked. If you eat it raw, it has a, a, a like a, a texture like a water chestnut almost, and the the flavor is sort of like a sweet broccoli stem. Um, so it's really different. You can also, like I said, um, gr um, uh, cook it. And I guess if you're like a keto person, it could be used as a substitute for potatoes. Um, it's you know you could, it's one of those ones that you could sort of play with the diet with. Um, and it's so easy to grow. So they have green uh, varieties, they have purple varieties. Um, this is a normal size variety. They also have giant varieties. Um, but yeah, they, they are really easy to grow. And as I said at the bottom, they plant and grow like turnips. I don't think they'll store as long as a turnip though. Um, you're gonna pick it when it's about, I'd say four or five inches in diameter. Um, if you plant more than one, you'll learn that if you wait too long, it'll start cracking. Um, but it's still edible if it cracks. It's just, you know, kind of learn the variety that way. Um, okay, so I guess that's it. That was a giant kohlrabi I, I planted years ago and um, thought it looked nice as a houseplant. <laughs> Questions? Thanks, Rachel. That was awesome. Yeah, and we have a pretty good amount of time for questions. I will say uh, we've been doing our best to respond to people in the chat as we went. So I do have a couple here that we can start it off with and then um, everybody feel free. You may not be able to unmute yourself, but feel free to throw additional questions into the chat. Um, we had a question towards the beginning and you mentioned container gardening in the mm -hmm. fall and how that might be different in the fall than in the summer. Mm -hmm. but are there any fall vegetables that you would recommend for containers? I would I would recommend like the leafy vegetables, your lettuces, spinach um, would be good in a container. 
I've grown carrots in a container. You just have to make sure that it's a deep container. Mm -hmm. Um, I have done broccoli in container. It didn't do great, but the container was small. So if you're doing like a cabbage or broccoli or a cauliflower, you just want a larger container. Um, but you know, you, you remember that you have this, um, this cold issue. So if you're limited to containers, one thing you can do is um, bunch them all together when a cold night's coming, bunch them all together and put um, cushions or straw or blankets like around the pots to try to keep that root area um, warmer. Yeah, thank you. Um, another question we had was when we were talking about starting plants, um, I guess it could be inside, I mean, it could be in con, um, trays or just in the ground, but uh -huh. so if you wanted to get fall plants started around uh -huh. now when it's still pretty hot and intense heat, uh -huh. Uh -huh. Um, can you use shade cloth for that? And if you do, do you know what a good rating is for? Oh! What a great question. Yes, you could absolutely use shade cloth. Um, that's a great way to do it. Um, I would stick to maybe 30% shade. I think 50% would be too much. Um, unless you were like super dedicated and had a tray that you kept out in full sun in the morning then moved it to the 50 percent like in the afternoon but yeah I, I would go with like max 30 percent uh one thing i've also done if you if you have old screen laying around in your house like a roll of screen um you can use like make a just a little tiny roof for your seedling area out of screen um, and that works well and you can and you can angle it so that the morning sun hits the plants But then you know as the sun goes over it hits that screen. So yeah, that's a great idea. Yeah, that's yeah That's a really great way to to start the transplants now um, We had some Kind of general questions about a couple of crops and I know it's impossible to cover everything But if you have any sort of salient points mm -hmm. or experience with either bok choy or fennel Okay, um, uh, bok choy. Um, I have not had experience with fennel. I bought the seed, forgot to sow it, so I'm sorry. Um, but I can tell you fennel is a summer crop um, that I'm aware of, or that you would be like a, a shoulder crop, a spring or fall. I don't think that would survive a freeze, mm -hmm. uh, correct? I have not planted fennel. I really like it, um, but I think you're right. It's It's not that it needs intense heat but um I, I don't think that it's particularly cold hardy yeah yeah i mean if you have seed on hand right now you could try to sow it right now especially because um, our falls are very iffy and sometimes you get a lot more warmth than we expect right 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 <laughs> right um but the the bok choy or pak choy i guess there's different spellings on it um it's fairly easy to grow here. It doesn't need a super um, high amount of fertility like your broccolis. Um, the biggest um, issue I've had with it are flea beetles. Um, they will just um, find their way inside of that sucker and eat it up and then you pick it and you don't realize they're there until you pull it apart. Mm -hmm. um, I believe a like a row cover would help with flea beetles um, to like exclude them. Not the bird netting, you know, flea beetles are mm -hmm. very small so you have to get you know much more um, netting, netting that they can't get through. Um, so it's like insect netting. And then you would want to make sure that you rotate um, with with that crop and not grow it in the same location every year so that you don't have that same pest problem. I haven't seen uh, too much disease on it. It's just that flea beetle issue. You Oh, you, you can get um, the cabbage worms as well with it. Um, so yeah, netting would be a great idea if you could. Yeah, great to know. Um, we had a question about, is there anything in an herb type, uh, you know, kind of herbs or spices that can be grown during the winter. So if you want fresh herbs. Yeah, so I'm not super versed in herb growing and herb harvesting and all that. I mean, I know that I was super surprised when I moved to Georgia, like, wow, time is all winter long. It looks pretty. So I mean, your thyme, oregano, and your rosemary are perennials and they will 
live um, as long as you want them. Um, however, the harvesting of them, I, I'm just not versed as to like how the flavor would compare in the winter versus if you did it in the summer. Um, but those are the three that pop in mind, like things like basil, dill, no, those are summer herbs. Um, but thyme, oregano, and rosemary are the big ones. Rosemary, um, if you grow rosemary, make sure it's in a very, very, very well-drained area mm -hmm. um, of the yard because it cannot handle wet soil at all. Very easy to grow, just like plant it and don't do anything <laughs> to water it. Sorry, I had to run. My dog was chewing on something. Uh, <laughs> While I've done this talk, I saw a hawk grab something <laughs> out of my secret garden. Oh, gosh. Oh, no, it's good. It's yeah, good. It's the best. Yeah. I have pet rabbits, so that's not a good thing in my Oh, oh, oh. Uh, yeah. So we had a question about parsnips. Um, would parsnips generally in terms of care and starting follow similar guidelines as carrots? Um, I, are, are parsnips like turnips? Parsnips are in the carrot and um, parsley. Family. Oh, I'm seeing. Okay, yeah. So obviously from my reaction to your question, yeah, I don't They look a sort of like one. a combination between a turnip and a <laughs> okay. Okay. Um, yeah. I mean, as I don't, I don't have experience with it, but I would follow my recommendations for carrots and turnips. Um, you would want to direct sow it. You can't transplant it. Um, and I feel like is this is a one where the flavor Im improves with the cold weather, um, and it looks similar to a carrot. So again, you know, you're going to want to. Um, like it's, it's a root crop, so you're going to want to make sure you have very well tilled um, ground or loose ground for it to grow in. Um, but I'm afraid I, I don't know much further than that. If you have like sp specific questions about it, if you shoot an email to the UGA extension, um, you know, we're happy to, to look up more details for you. Yeah, absolutely. Um, we have so. Uh, Corey asked about flea beetles, which you sort of answered uh, <laughs> while answering the bok choy question. Yeah. And then Cheryl had a comment that tool actually works fairly well as preventing the smaller insect pests. Oh. In fabric. That's a great idea. Yes. Um, in, in terms, uh, just in terms of something else that wasn't covered specifically, mm -hmm. any experience growing like a greens mix sort of you know not necessarily oh. as a lettuce but just green mixes hey and i'm not sure if this is talking about like you can buy seed packets or you know that that'll say like mixed greens or they'll have several different varieties of lettuce in it they'll say lettuce mix um the, I'm um, personally not into them, but I don't think there's necessarily anything wrong with them. Um, just for me, um, I like to, like with that, you have things that potentially germinate at different times and that are also ready at different times. Um, that being said, I am a commercial grower and you guys are home growers. So, you know, for me, it's more important that I have all the red, you know, maturing at the same time as the green, but, you know, as a, as a home grower, that's not an issue. So that would be the most cost effective way to get different types of greens going. Um, you would have to be, you know, very careful with weeds um, and trying to, you know, identify yeah. what is your green and what is the weed and, you know, I've pulling been appropriately. I've been in that situation <laughs> before. Yeah, you have to be really diligent about clearing up your weed bed before you plant your greens mix. Or, very or good idea. Really yeah. well. um, I will, one comment on the greens from just some experience I had when I was growing for a farmer's market mm -hmm. is, um, usually the density so depending on how you're going to be harvesting as a either like a small market grower or a homeowner the way we used to do it is it would be planted at a much higher density than we would plant sort of our lettuces that we were planning on harvesting the entire lettuce ah. so mm -hmm. we would usually go through and because it was a greens mix you would just continuously pick off you know up to like a third of the leaves on any given one of you just go through and clip off a bunch of leaves. So you can actually get away with planting a sort of denser planting scattered 
the right. planting of those mixes because you're harvesting continuously instead of wanting each individual plant to have the amount of space that you would normally need. Very good point, yeah. Um, I think we may be caught up. Uh, I'm, I tried to keep track. We had a really active, excellent chat growing, going. Awesome. Um, if I missed anybody's question, feel free to just throw it back in the chat. Um, we had a question about Brussels sprouts. That's good. I can't believe we didn't. <laughs> Brussels I'm sorry I'm laughing because I have a friend that keeps wanting me to grow them, and I just only know one person who wants me to grow them. <laughs> and I asked my customers, do you like Brussels sprouts? No. Um, Brussels sprouts are difficult. Um, I have tried them, and I failed. And it's an issue of our erratic winter weather. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, you, you, you could do it and succeed, but, um, the, the, the temperature is an issue. It's, it's like these, these, this time of type of crop is great grown in the central Valley of California, where it's like 65 degrees for months on end. And they can totally control the water that the plant gets. Um, our, our very rainy winters are going to be an issue. And just the timing, um, if you get those Brussels to start forming and then we have a hard freeze or, you know, 25, 20 degrees, I don't think it's going to make it. So I, my advice, if I were going to do it, if I had ended up growing it this year, I'd try to do it in a protected location, um, you know, somewhere that I feel might not get quite as cold um, as other areas. And then... Um, yeah. Can you add anything, Laura? No, I've only grown them once. I find both Brussels sprouts, Brussels sprouts, Brussels sprouts and broccoli to be sort of difficult. And, and it's kind of what you said at your experience with broccoli is they just take some getting to know the crop and how they yes. respond. So if you're interested in either of those, I'd highly recommend just planting a few, you know, maybe yes. some friends with some seeds. The extension often has office often has free seeds. So if we have any broccoli or Brussels sprouts, we'd be happy to give you just a handful of free seeds if you want to give it a try and see what works and what doesn't. Um, yeah, it can be a little finicky. Well, and that comment makes me think that fertility is a big issue right. with it. Both of them you know, are such large plants. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So, you know, if, if you're love Brussels sprouts and you're hell bent on it, use your whole bag of compost on that area. You know? <laughs> yeah, maybe. Um, we had a quick question, not specifically veg, uh, fall garden related, uh -huh. but certainly fall garden related as to dropping off soil samples. So I know we've got people from a lot of different areas joining us. You can drop them off at any of your local extension offices. Um, everybody's functioning a little bit differently because of COVID. So I'd recommend just shooting your local office an email or giving them a call tomorrow and seeing what the deal is with them. For the Athens area, we accept them every day. We have a little drop-off location outside of the office where you can leave your payment in the samples and we, we collect them and take them to the lab daily or every other day. So, um, and then we had a great question that I think you'll be able to speak to, Rachel, um, for if you would recommend a greenhouse for the fall. Oh. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> it, it was very hard not to mention mine during this talk. <laughs> I want to make you jealous, but oh yes, oh yes. Um, and it doesn't even have to be a greenhouse. Um, if you could just get something to cover, like a plastic ceiling mm -hmm. um, to keep the rain off of your stuff, because it's not just the it's it's not the temperature so much that that hurts things here it's the darn precipitation yeah There's just so much rain so oh boy yes 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 absolutely um you will grow greens and spinach all winter long in either a heated greenhouse or an unheated um covered structure like a high tunnel or a low tunnel um you can generally keep greens going all year round you just have so much more flexibility you don't have to be, um, you know, in the beginning of the talk, I said there's a there's a timing thing that's so important here about not going too early, but not going too late. When you have the greenhouse, you have a lot more flexibility in planting time. Yeah, yeah, it definitely gives you, you know, we can't control everything, but it's nice when you get a little more control. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, we had a question about spinosad and BT. They're asking if they're really organic. So they are both on recertified organic, correct? 
joke, you know. Oh, I didn't know that. Okay. Uh, I know what is the BT, mean? I mean, it may depend on the specific product. I mean, check the label. And again, that's something you can check with your local extension office if you want to double check it if you're doing certified organic mm -hmm. or concerned with that. Um, spinosad and BT are available compounds and have different names and a lot of different products. So just always check the specific product that you're getting to see if it is on the OMRI certified list. Yeah, there's, I know there's like, um, you can, you can tell it was Spinoza at least by the price. Um, I pay out the, the wazoo for my Spinoza. I mean, it is, it's, it has OMRI approved on the oh, bottle. Yeah. Um, so the synthetically produced Spinoza is going to be a lot cheaper than the. Yeah. I mean, it depend on the specific product that you're getting in terms of certified organic. Right. Um, we had a question that I guess is really more for myself and Joanna but a, about a class on greenhouse growing. I think that's an excellent idea. That is a really good segue. I know um, we're getting to the 730 mark but I wanted to um, emphasize that if you did not register um, through the registration site, not a big deal. We're really happy that you were able to make it but send an email to myself or Joanna right. Um, uh, Joanna can you put that slide up on the screen? I'm sharing it, but I don't know if Rachel. Oh, do I hear sharing? Uh, see if you can unshare. Here, I'll stop um, shared. There you go. Yeah, Joanna's <laughs> information is up there. Please uh, send her an email if you did not register, because you'll get a lot of follow-up information. And then, if you also please, if you got the evaluation, um, take a minute. It's really not very long. We tried to make it as painless as possible, but it's really helpful in um, helping us decide on future programming for these. So yeah, I think greenhouse is a great idea. Just make sure you put that in the comments. And we always look at those when we're planning for the next season. I would love um, to talk about greenhouses. Yeah, too, we have a lot of growers that would have great insight for that. I think that'd be yeah. great. And um, you think it's going to be, you think it, you're like, oh, we'll just get the greenhouse and go. And then there's all these things that you never even thought of <laughs> that come up. Yeah. So yeah. Cool uh, class idea. And then the last thing I'll say, and we'll stick around for just a few more minutes if people have uh, more questions, but I know it's time to go, is just that uh, thank you all for joining. And remember, this is a monthly lecture series that we do all the time. And keep an eye out for the future topics. Our next one coming up is going to be on beekeeping for beginners. So we have a great speaker, the president of the Piedmont Beekeepers Association, is going to be talking to us about that. So um, yeah. Uh, thank y'all for joining. Please do the evaluation and hope to see y'all at a future lecture. Excellent. Thank you. Um, Rachel, thank you, are you Rachel. still on? Yes, I am still on. We had a, a quick last minute question about neem oil. Yes, and I see it, that. Yeah. Oh yeah, if you can see this. Yes, neem oil will work on fall crops, absolutely. In fact, um, Neem oil is one that you should watch out for in summertime. It's kind of dangerous in um, really hot weather, but in cooler weather, um, it should be fine. However, I do remember when you mix the neem oil, um, if it's cold outside, like if you're spraying and it's 55 degrees outside, use uh, warm water from your house mm. to mix it with. Don't use cold water. I didn't know that. Even every day. All right. Well, I think that's it. And so right, thank you guys. It was awesome as usual. Thanks for joining us. It was good All to right. hear you, Rachel. <laughs> oh, I know. It's been so long. I know. <laughs> All right. Well, happy gardening, everybody. Thanks.